All right, well, thank you all to, for joining the seminar today. Of course, we have our very own Dr. Jones presenting his work. And uh, most people know Dr. Jones, but I'll give a sort of a short overview of some of his accomplishments because I only have a few minutes. Um, but, you know, Dr. Jones has been everywhere, um, had academic positions in Santa Fe, San Jose, North Carolina, Colorado, and Penn State. Um, he also had the luxury of visiting professorships at the University of Bordeaux and Louis Pasteur in France and Ben Gurion University in the Nedjaf in Israel. So I first met Byron in 2014 while he was still a professor at Penn State and pursuing numerous projects using the BXD panel to better understand G by E interactions, pharmacogenetics, and systems genetics of alcohol, stress, metals in the brain, and toxins. And our department was really fortunate because he agreed to trade Penn State for Tennessee and join UTHC in 2014, and he brought several R01s with him. So to highlight just a few accomplishments, 141 publications and 36 graduate students as a direct or, or co-mentor. And a lot of those graduate students have gone on to have careers in academia. And, and a lot of those are names we know like Melanie Cook, Cheryl Reed, and, and Lisa Tarantino. And uh, Byron has been a great mentor to me and he's an endless source of knowledge for myself and others in the department. Um, that's from everything from statistics to old movie quotes. So we love having Byron around. And um, also I just want to say that his French is pretty good and you should definitely ask him one day to talk about his dissertation project with THC, fruit punch, social interactions and squirrel monkeys. So <laughs> without further ado, um, Dr. Byron Jones, um, please share your screen and tell us about your recent forays into Gulf War illness using the BXT panel. Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, actually, I think I've learned more from you than, you, than I've taught you. So we'll, we'll, call, we'll call it a draw on that. So um, yeah, I've been here six years now, and I've kind of moved into an area of, of, of interest in, in toxicogenetics. And let, can I show my screen here? Hang on. Here we go. Yeah, so I can do this from the beginning. So I'm going to tell you today a little bit about the work that we've been doing to understanding the why some people got sick. Aaron, we're not seeing your screen yet. If you intend us to see your screen, we're not seeing it. It said show screen. Where the hell am I? Hang on a second. And, and, um, and you are being recorded, just so you remember. <laughs> yeah, so I won't tell, I, I, I won't use it. Megan will bleep you and me for that matter. <laughs> so share screen. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Nope. Nope. Share. Did you see the... share. There you go. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. It says launch meeting. Oh, no, not that one. No, don't do that. So if, um, let me see if I can, I'm going to stop your sharing. So if you put, if you hit share screen, if you have your, do you have your PowerPoint selected? I do. So if you hit share screen again, and then uh, click on the PowerPoint icon, when you see the list of screens. Let's see if that works. Um, I don't see it there. Can I go over here and get it? Did that work? No. Perfect. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Gulf War illness. Um, and I got interested in this with a colleague of mine who works for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, a CDC uh, department, uh, Jim O'Callaghan, who uh, is working at the CDC office in, um, in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. So there are no, no conflicts of interest to declare here, no pharmaceuticals to be, be discussed. We're gluten-free and non-GMO. So the Gulf War uh, was conducted by the United States and our 35 alli allies uh, from August 1990 to February 1991, after uh, Saddam had invaded Kuwait. And so we're going to protect Kuwait from Saddam. It involved almost a million 
military personnel from 35 countries, 700,000 from the USA. And of those who were deployed in the, in the, in the war zone, 25 to 30% became ill with a multi-symptom malaise now called Gulf War illness. So after the war was over and we brought these people back, they were still sick. There were, there were accusations of malingering, but these people are really sick and they're still sick. So the Kansas system of diagnos diagnostic criteria, three more symptoms of, of uh, pain and sleep problems, neurological, mood, gastrointestinal, uh, respiratory problems and skin uh, symptoms. It's multi-symptom. The CDC says two or three symptoms categories, fatigue, mood cognition and musculoskeletal problems. To date, few of those afflicted have recovered. And so Gulf War illness is a chronic dis disease. And people who have it are really debilitated. So what caused Gulf War illness? Well, it was the exposure to something in theater. So we had burn pit fire smoke as a candidate, oil well fire smoke. Remember, uh, Saddam uh, torched all the oil wells that, that were in the, in the area. Depleted uranium, the um, A-10 uh, aircraft has a machine gun that fires bullets made of depleted uranium. It's much, much more dense than lead. Uh, also from other munitions and from shields, organophosphorus compounds, uh, including insecticides like chlorpyrifos, which is applied in the barracks to keep mosquitoes and other critters down. Other agents like sarin and cycloserin, this is accidental exposure to 100,000 troops. When we went, we didn't re realize that Saddam had taken his gas canisters containing these nerve gases and put them in his ammunition dumps. What's the first thing we did when he, when he got in theater? We blew up the ammunition dumps and exposed 100,000 of our troops uh, to uh, these uh, nerve gases. We don't know uh, if anybody died or how many people were sick, but a lot of people uh, uh, suffered um, low exposure. Pyridostigmine is another um, cholinesterase inhibitor like the, uh, uh, like the organophosphorus compounds. And it's used as prophylaxis against serin. The idea is that pyridostigmine uh, inhibits cholinesterase. And so you make more cholinesterase as a result. Barracuda exhaust was also uh, nominated. And other possible risks are pre-existing uh, illnesses like the flu, having a cold, and also High circulating uh, glucocorticoids like, like cortisol, uh, if you're being shot at every day, you're gonna have elevated um, glucocorticoids running around. So the major hypothesis about Gulf War illness um, advanced by a lot of people, but also um, uh, Jim O'Callaghan, is that sickness behavior is a major component. It's a, an effect of neuroinflammation, consequent um, uh, neuroimmunological response to toxicants, this is all uh, Robert Robert Dancer. I think we can maybe get here for a seminar sometime. Neuroinflammation following exposure to neurotoxin is exacerbated by high circulating glucocorticoids, and that's some of the work of Robert Sapolsky. We normally think of, of uh, glucocorticoids as being anti-inflammatory, but depending on when they're uh, administered during the stressor, they can actually promote neuroinflammation. So the final list of culprits, depleted uranium, nope. Smoke, nope. Barrack heater exhaust, nope. Pyridostigmine, well, maybe, but not primary. And so our major culprits are the organophosphorus compounds, serotonin and chlorpyrifos. These are irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors and the most likely uh, culprits. And what else? High circulating cortisol in a stressful combat situation. So, Knowing this, armed with this, O'Callaghan and his partner, Diane Miller, uh, said, okay, let's develop a, a, an animal model. So what are we gonna use, mouse or a rat? So they decided they settled on using a black six mouse, only males, and the exposure was, you cannot use sarin. And matter of fact, they replicated this work at the Edgewood Arsenal using sarin for $400 a treatment. Yeah, so we don't use sarin. It's too dangerous and it's too expensive if you have somebody else do it. So the surrogate for sarin is diosopropyl fluorophosphate. It has the same me mechanism of action as sarin, but it's far less hazardous and it's something that our institutional animal care and use committee lets me, let me use. Glucocorticoids, well, corticosterone is the um, 
rodent equivalent of cortisol, and they put the corticosteroid in the drinking water. It costs 20 milligrams per cent. So the protocol that they developed was corticosteroid in their drinking water for seven days. On eight, day eight, hit, hit them with diacetylpropyl fluorophosphate and then euthanize the animals at six hours later and uh, take out the prefrontal cortex, they also did the hippocampus and analyze pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokine gene expression. And, and we use IL-1 beta, IL-6 and TNF-alpha, they use three more. But we don't. We had money just to do three of these uh, cytokines. Byron, if might you ask can... why we're not just measuring cytokines. Well, cytokines are almost impossible to measure in brain tissue. It's, it's really difficult. It can be done, but it's very, very difficult. So, Byron, if you can see your your um, chat window. There's a question from Andy Griffith going back two slides. Yeah, I'll this. just I'll just ask it. Um, so I guess we'll, we can just interrupt Byron during sure. the talk. <laughs> he likes that. So. Um, yeah, so the question was for the, the factors that might be involved, um, how were those possible factors ruled out? Epidemiology, lab experiments? Um, mostly uh, measuring what was in the bloodstream and what was in the blood of the people so affected. And again, any, any one of these could still be players, but, but it's likely not. Uh, Got it, so thanks. Initial, so, say again? I said, thanks, Byron. Oh, you're welcome. So the initial findings was, uh, I'll show you here that in the black six with the IL-1 beta. So you see here the difference in gene expression from control, obviously zero the control, and then corticosterone here. Diacetylpropyl fluorophosphate did not produce any neuroinflammation, but look at the DFP plus corticosterone, and we did both sexes, males and females, and we found a sex difference as well as a synergistic um, effect of corticosterone plus VFP. So okay, Byron, you have, a, you have VFP another VFP. question, another question. Um, and that is, okay, this, wait, who is it? it's from Chelsea. Chelsea, do you want to ask the question? Yes. Sure. Um, so I was wondering, in, in the model you're using, does the single exposure to DFP, I know you, I noticed you're harvesting six hours after, if you let it go for longer, would it, uh, would the effects persist over time? And would it, you know, model? The answer, the answer is yes, and I'll get to that at the very end of the talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so actually going back one here, so, Oops, no, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. So Jim O'Callaghan presented these data at um, a toxicology meeting in New Orleans a number of years ago. And uh, I said, these are impressive data. I said, you picked on our, one of our favorite mouse strains, black six mouse. I said, what about the other people who did not get sick? 25 to 30% of the Gulf War veterans developed GWI. What about the others who did not, everything else being equal? So lucky for us that O'Callaghan and Miller used the black six uh, mice. And so I said, why don't we uh, see what happens when we uh, treat uh, DBAs and both sexes? So we went back to the lab and uh, Diane and uh, Jim came down and we ran a, a blitz um, preliminary data uh, run on this. And so you see here, uh, can, you, can you see? Uh, can you see this? I guess yes. you can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so the left panel, you see that what you saw the data before the black six mice and the boys and the girls, DFP plus DFP plus court. But look what happens when we also do the same thing to the DBA mice. Same thing. Males are more sensitive than the females in terms of the increase in uh, pro-inflammatory gene expression. And they're less sensitive than, 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 the, than the black six mice. So armed with these data, we wrote a grant application to the Department of Defense. For me, as a new investigator at my age, I'm going to say, and, and uh, lo and behold, we, we, we hit pay dirt the first time in. And we proposed to repeat this experiment in 30 of the BXD strains so we can get, kind of get an idea of the genetic basis 
for individual differences in susceptibility to developing one, one more question for you, Byron. It's from Bert Sharp. So what is the corticosterone increment above basal early night levels that is achieved by the pharmacological dosing? Oh, so, so the dosing that we gave there um, confers, that's a good question. It confers um, it, at least 40 milligrams per, per, um, 40 milligrams, um, per kilogram a dose. Which is which is huge compared to, to uh, the the normal circadian um, uh, fluctuation. So, so we did the replicate study in the BXD mice, four treatment groups controlled, no court, no DFP, and we measured IL one beta, IL six, and TNF alpha. So for the controls, uh, we had court only for seven days, analysis of expression of IL one beta. IL-6 and TNF-alpha. DFP only, injection in the morning, harvest six hours later, analysis of, of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then court plus DFP, that's, that's, our target, that's our target treatment. So we did 30 BXD strains, plus we had the data from the parentals, boys and girls, two to four months old, and five data animals per strain for sex for treatment conditions. Nice balanced design. So our results were how much how much corticosterone these guys drink. Diane and Je and Jim did not measure the amount of corticosterone that that, that black six mice were drinking, but we did. Um, so we're looking at I one beta expression, court versus control, DFP versus con versus control, and then our our target treatment. Same thing for IL six and TNF alpha. Then we went uh, mapped uh, for a candidate gene nomination, and we used just for IL one beta. And, and then RNA seq analysis. So here is how much these little guys are drinking per day over seven days. And there's no change per day in how much they drink. And the black six mice, although they, they're not, they don't bracket the B, B6 and D2s do not bracket the response. But it turns out you can give B6 corticosterone and they'll drink every bit of it if they, if they can. Um, B6 mice like to drink just about anything and they, they, they love corticosterone for some reason, we're not sure why. So if you look at the variability here, you wonder, hmm, is that going to be a covariate for your, your major index? And it turns out it's, it's not. So here's IL-1 beta expression of treatment with corticosterone all over the place, nothing, nothing, nothing here to see. There's some strain differences, of course. But here's what's interesting here. So here's the top panel is females. The black bars are DFP only, and the gray bars, the white bars, are DFP plus corticosterone. And so you can see that in every single strain, um, except maybe for 81 way at the, at the right end, um, corticosterone enhances the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine expression uh, with DFP. DFP by itself, some strains yes, some strains no. See the same thing with the males. Males are more, if it looks, I, if you eyeball it, it looks like the males are more sensitive than females. And then when we run the actually analysis, statistical analysis, uh, the males are, um, show there's a significant sex effect. Here's IL-6 expression of treatment with corticosterone. Again, all over the place. So quick quick um, uh, question, Byron. So what tissues or cells or plasma was used to measure these um, pro-inflammatory cytokines? Oh, this, I'm sorry, did I say the uh, prefrontal cortex? Just the prefrontal cortex. Okay. And again, here's IL-6. Uh, females, males, again, nothing really stands out. And then TNF alpha uh, after corticosterone and then, cortic and then DFP plus corticosterone. So it looks very much like um, IL-1 beta. As a matter of fact, the responses between the two pro-inflammatory cytokines are correlated, okay? So what did we do? We went after what's going on with IL-1 beta expression in the, in, the, in the frontal cortex with cort plus DFP. 
And for those of you who are familiar with this sort of thing that we do, we get a nice peak, um, significant peak on chromosome seven near the telomere and it has good um, boot, bootstrap support. And so we went looking for genes underneath um, that, that peak. And we came up with one really pretty good um, candidate gene, Spondin 1, as a phenotypic QTL for the expression of, of, of um, IL-1 beta. So Spond 1 is cis-regulated, which is good. Expression of Spond 1 under no treatment condition is correlated with our phenotype. That's, that's also good. Um, it's a protein in humans encoded by Spond 1 gene. It's called F Spondin. It's secreted uh, by cells at the floor of the neural crest, four cells of the neural crest, and is probably involved in axon guidance. The uh, protein is 807 amino acid residues. So, Byron, you have a question about the QTO map from Paige. Paige, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, I was just curious if it was uh, created combining data of both sexes. I couldn't really tell. Yes. yes. Yeah, we, we actually that we, we made a, pr a principal component. Okay. So here's the correlation between our principal component and um, uh, expression of spond in one, negatively correlated, um, sig highly significant. Okay. And the numbers here by the dots are actually the, the oops, where am I? Are the uh, strain numbers, the BXD strain numbers. So it turns out that the probe that showed the significant uh, QTL was at the three prime uh, untranslated region, and Rob helped, Rob helped me with this. It turns out here out at this area, the three prime untranslated region, we get higher expression in the B6 mice. And these are B6 and these are D2s. We get higher expression in the B6 mice than we do in the, D2, the ones carrying the alleles for the B6 allele. So we think that there's something out there. And of course, this is an area of gene regulation. So there's something out there that we haven't we haven't we haven't approached to go after yet. But there's something out there that's uh, that's probably causal and, and driving the differences. So why do we like spawned in one? Well, it's involved in axon guidance during development. It's a player in the in the wingless beta catenin signaling. Uh, cell adhesion, and also transcription factor. It's um, also involved in tumor growth factor beta inflammatory response. It um, is active in chemotherapy agent, uh, agent toxicity. And there's a mutation in this gene that contributes to cognitive deterioration in those carrying the APOE4 um, uh, genotype, the elevated uh, neurocorticoid amyloid um, uh, B um, uh, protein burden. It may be related to cognitive difficulties in those with GLP4 illness. So what else? So we also ran RNA-seq analysis. We got two papers out of this. So we did the preparation of prefrontal cortex for analysis. Um, uh, Novogene uh, did, the work, did, the, did, the, did the work for us. And so we were able to do genome-wide analysis of gene expression related to DFP and CORT plus DFP versus control. So this is, I, I, can't, I won't show you the whole works, but what's really interesting here is when we did the gene enrichment um, 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 the, the, uh, 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 analysis, we found that, just look at this part of, of this sphere here plus DFP plus control, we get um, genes that are involved in inflammatory bowel disease, staph aureus infection, cytokine, cytokine receptor interaction, that's interesting. Rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, a lot of GWI uh, veterans do have, and, and T helper cell 17 cell differentiation. And we'll come back to this in a little bit because uh, that's kind of that's kind of that's what we, we think is important here. Uh, TNF signaling pathway and NF kappa beta uh, signaling pathway, which is a, um, um, a gene expression um, uh, uh, 
regulator, MAP kinase signaling pathway, osteoclast differentiation, uh, chemical carcinogenesis, age rage signaling pathway, um, and malaria. So a whole lot of uh, cluster of, of gene enrichment um, patterns that seem to uh, fit with uh, some of the symptoms that we see with Gulf War illness. Dr. John, uh, I have a question. How did you uh, how did you choose like for example pathway in cancer two or three five uh, differentially exp expressed genes versus like you know nine zero one mineral absorption? So my overall question is for example suppose if you got five thousand differentially expressed genes, right? So th those uh, genes will be uh, like. Uh, another tissue type signature genes also. How did you choose uh, like those genes which are either related to mineral absorption or like pathway in cancer and like cytokine, cytokine, uh, you know, oh, so, these, so these were generated by the software. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm asking. What the, what the software did you choose to uh, like enrich the R or like GSEA, something like that? No, it's in, it's in the software, it's ontological analysis. So this, okay. this is what pops up. Okay. We, we didn't choose these, these were chosen for us. Oh, okay. 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 So Byron, is the effect of DFP mediated through nicotinic or muscarinic receptors or is it independent of receptor mediation? Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, it turns out that only Irreversible cholinesterase inhibitors, the organophosphorus compounds, uh, cause, cause this problem. So if you use reversible cholinesterase inhibitors, um, you don't get the same thing. So, it's, so it's, we think it's cholinesterase independent. Okay. Number one. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. So then we also got uh, a second um, candidate gene. Um, Chemokine receptor 6, CCR6, is an EQTL coming out of the RNA seq analysis. And this is pretty interesting as well. So here's the response DFP, court plus DFP. So here you don't see the same kind of pattern that we saw with IL 1B, but we, we, get, we do get, let's see here, I need to, um, how do I get rid of this? There. So if you look at CCR6 expression for the control versus DFP versus cord plus DFP, you see that, that you see a decrease in the expression of this particular um, chemokine uh, receptor. Okay. And so why does CCR interest us? Well, CCR6 receptors are found on uh, T helper 17 cells. Uh, you notice that from, from the, the previous slide we showed you with the, with the first RNA seq analysis. The ligand, the CCL20, regulates migration of TH17, which is um, pro inflammatory and um, it puts out a, a, a cytokine, um, um, uh, a, a chemokine 17, and T regulator cells that play opposing roles in autoimmune disease and maybe go for illness. Related to in our BXD mice, brain to body weight, acoustic startle, total entries in the Y maze, um, anxiety like behaviors, and fecal corticosterone, again, all in our BXD strains. So we're pretty interested in, in, in this particular um, uh, EQTL and this possible candidate gene. So it also regulates general neuroinflammation via pro inflammatory cytokines. And CCR6 receptor inhibits, inhibitors may be target for Gulf War treatment. So that's what Jim and I are plotting to um, uh, approach in our next, in our next uh, uh, research effort here. So for our conclusions, Gulf War illness is a complex disease where genes and environment are actors. We've been able to model some of the pathophysiology of GWI and have nominated two candidate genes, Spondin 1 and CCR6 related pathways as potential therapeutic uh, targets. So, Gulf War illness is a chronic disorder, and our model addresses the acute phase response following exposure. So, we need to develop a model that addresses the chronic nature. So, what's next? 
So now we need to sort out what our candidates genes do vis-a-vis -vis Gulf War illness. And that's what Jim and I are working on now. Find out the basis for chronic nature of the disease. So we have a pending NIHS funding, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, funding to study the genetics of epigenetic changes relevant to GWI that have been sick for, these people have been sick for 30 years. So what we're going to do is we're going to replicate the design and instead of looking at gene expression um, by RNA seq, we're going to do we're going to look at methylation patterns 300 days after after treatment. So we're looking for chronic changes in gene expression that may be related to why these people have been sick for so long. And so uh, we'll be doing some more study of neuroinflammation as a complex trait. So our contributor Jim O'Callaghan is a Senior Distinguished Scientist at the Centers for Disease Control, NIOSH facility in Morgantown, West Virginia. He and I have been working together for the better part of um, 15 years now. We've done a lot of work with other neurotoxins like MPTP and uh, Paraquat. Diane Miller was his um, partner for many, many years. And right after we developed, got, we, right after we obtained the preliminary data for the um, uh, Department of Defense grant, she was diagnosed with um, endometrial cancer and she lasted about a year. That's apparently that's one of the worst kinds you can get. Lulu, uh, one of our colleagues here and Fu Yi who did a postdoc here with Lulu. Athena, um, uh, who is uh, one of our faculty. And Zhong Gao, who is uh, one of our uh, collaborators here uh, during his stay here at UT. Megan, David Ashbrook is going to help us also with, with the next phase of this research. Wen Yan Shuo is the uh, a lab chief and Da Ming. Uh, he, uh, Wen Yan and Da Ming actually did the, the real uh, ex experimental work. And Carolina Torres, who was just defending her PhD with us with a, with a pair of quad work, she also helps with this as well. We acknowledge the support from the Department of Defense CMRP, CDMRP grant. This is Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Um, and this is the, the, the money, we did all this work uh, on $500,000 for three years. So, and we, I think we were, we were lucky to get this money and it nominated me as a new investigator. Imagine that. So I'll take questions. Well, thank you, Byron. And thank you for allowing a lot of times for question and discussion. So um, graduate students, you've been doing a good job asking questions, are there any more of you would like to ask questions? I explained it that well, huh? <clears throat> so I guess, I mean, I guess, did you circle back to Chelsea's question about the single exposure to DFP? Um, also, um, see, does the single exposure to DFP also model persistence of Gulf War illness over time in addition to immediate effects six hours after exposure. So is that, you know, where do you want to go? Well, for the chronic work, we're going to do a single exposure, which seems to do the trick, by the way. Um, some of the animals will actually develop non-lethal non convulsions to the DFP. Um, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to treat the animals with, uh, put, put the corticosterone in the drinking water hit them with the DFP, and then on six more occasions, um, put, D put uh, corticosterone on the drinking water. This tends to enhance uh, the inflammatory response over time. And, this, and Jim O'Callaghan has already done this, done this work. And then 300 days later, which would put the animals at about the age, middle age of humans, equivalent of humans, about age, uh, late 40s, mid 50s, and then, then we'll, we'll do the analysis, of, uh, look for methylation patterns. We're gonna use MBD-seq and actually um, uh, ben, Benny's gonna, gonna help us with that work. So I, I gather that they, um, there's some other phenotypes or I guess diseases that have been associated with Gulf War illness. Any plans to, to look for signs like that in the BXDs after chronic? Well, I was thinking of adding a beha couple of behavioral measures, uh, probably, um, one of the things we can do is check their memory. I like uh, passive avoidance uh, myself. 
So that's what, that's one of the things that's in the, in the planning. All right, thanks, Byron. Uh, any more questions from the audience members? Yeah, I got I a question, Byron. <laughs> Byron, what, do you assume that um, the DFP is targeting microglia as the primary target and that, for example, corticosterone is somehow or another enabling the uh, microglia to respond to DFP? That's what we think, but we don't know exactly. Yes. So a follow-up to that then. It, it'll give you opportunity to speculate if you want to. Does DFP get into the nucleus? And if so, what do you think it's doing to the genome? And is corticosterone somehow altering the structure of the uh, genome, which we know it does, to enable DFP to do this? Well, that's what that's one of the hypotheses, but we don't, you know, we don't have any direct evidence for that ourselves. Although that's certainly something we could, we can try to explore. Yes. Okay. Andrew. Byron, thanks for a really interesting talk. I I am I might have missed this, but I'm trying to connect the dots between your candidate gene to your favorite candidates and the your proposal to look at the epigenome. So I was curious how you're gonna work up these, these candidate genes and try to determine if these are or are not actual, the actual harbor variants contributing to the observed changes. Well, we're going to be doing genome-wide in BDC. So whether our candidate genes here pop up or not, May happen. Okay. Who knows? Okay. So, so we're actually we're actually going into this. We're going into this agnostically. Byron, I had a question about. Well, maybe it's a comment first, and then a question. The comment is that the data that sets that you've generated now are perfect for causal modeling, and I can hear the second year graduate students moaning. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you you definitely want to have a look at um, the counterfactual components of Book of Y by by Judea Pearl. Uh, Lulu and Fu Yi and a team of us used used a Bayesian causal modeling that Yan Sui has implemented as part of the of a study on the impact of ACE2 polymorphisms on body weight loss after influenza infection. So some data that Klaus Schugart had had uh, generated, and our our mediator tier was just RNA seq data. I mean, it worked really well. It was, um, I would say it worked better just for helping me and I think Lulu and Fuyi solidify our ideas about ca causal modeling and some of the problems. But you've got the perfect data set for doing that. You've got the RNA-seq. You actually yep. have three limbs to your study. So you should definitely talk to Yan Sui about doing the causal modeling with Bayesian Network Web Server. If not, you should just do it yourself because it's, it's pretty straightforward code but it'll add a whole uh, tier of sophistication to your going from the causal variant through the, that whole cascade of possible mediators to the outcome measures, um, malaise, et cetera. Uh, I think you, you get a big kick out of it. Um, the question I had had to do with a, one of your slides, you say you had a PQTL. Was that, did you Those mean- the phenotype, That was a phenotype for the expression of IL-1 beta. Principal component analysis, PC1. So, so, and, I used, and I made a, uh, yeah, sorry, I took uh, IL-1 beta from males and females and combined and made a principal component. And, and the P in your, in your lingo just stands for phenotype? That's it. Okay, uh, it, it's confusing, uh, especially if you're talking about molecules because PQTL has sort of been reserved for, for proteins. Um, phenotypes don't need one. <laughs> okay. But, okay, I guess. <laughs> just, just make sure you tell no, people. I was trying to make a distinction between DNA structure and, and, and gene expression. Okay, got it, got it. Um, Andrew. I had another question if Rob's done. Rob, are you done? Yep. So I was curious, I saw there was a sex difference um, with several of the phenotypes you were looking at, including the corticosterone ingestion, but also I think initially there were sex differences in the, I think it was the induction maybe of 
IL-1 beta after the exposure. And, and was, alpha. T, t, thanks. And what I was wondering was when you look, did your QTL mapping, I think you said that you, you group the sexes together and I was kind so of you curious. Get same, you, get the same, you get the same peak, you get a bigger peak in the males than you do in the females. Okay. But it's the same peak. It just, so it basically it, looks the same. What do you exactly. know about um, sex as a risk factor for Gulf War illness? Is there any change in the prevalence or severity? Well, we just found the skunk in the, in the punch bowl. Women tend to be more sensitive than men. So in, how that works out, so the mouse is a different, it's opposite the mice. Oh, okay. That, I mean, that makes sense. That's true of almost all uh, immune disorders. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah. So Jim and I are really trying to hunker down and figure out what's going on with this whole uh, uh, um, uh, IL-17 um, uh, system because it's, it's involved in all kinds of, of uh, immune um, uh, disorders. Well, that was, that was a conversation killer. I was just thinking, I was wondering, you did a fairly part, I think, well, no, with your, with your RNA, RNA seq, you would have looked at all the cytokine and immune genes. Um, well, uh, we looked at the, the whole bunch of them, and we just we just scratch. The data are so complicated. I mean, so yeah. so massive that we we just scratched the surface here. So we picked the ones that stood out that, that really caught our eye. My recollection as a novice in this area is that um, there's certain like panels of these genes that are involved with immunity and inflammation and you can plug in your differential expression data and, and basically the, the, what they'll spit out is the underlying pathway or pathways that are um, affected. And I'm just trying to think about your data in my head to see if there's any, um, any well, actually, yeah, we do find we do find clusters. We find um, uh, groups of genes that seem to that hang together, and certainly uh, IL one, um, um, IL seventeen, uh, and CCL six uh, belong to a big group of other genes as well. Right, and you had the Venn diagram with those um, on ontology pathways, right? right. Byron, do you still have tissue from, from these cases? Oh, uh, I'm sure we do. I th we have liver for certain. Um, Anything great? We, we, try, we try to take more tissue than we need because it may come up, help us do something else later on. So I have to ask Wen Yuan what, what all, uh, Wen Yuan, are you, are you on? He is, yeah. Wen Yuan. He's yeah, on here and uh, we have liver, lung, and their uh, what, what about any what about any brain region when young yeah we have some other uh, uh location of brains and but we, we have we have hippo, we uh do we have hippocampus i need to double check i don't want to give okay. it the reason because, I have have brain tissue. because it's quite straightforward um rather expensive but quite straightforward now to get great proteomics data if you yeah. have about 20 milligrams of tissue. And we got a data set back from Xu Sheng Wang, who's now at the University of North Dakota. Actually, it was generated at St. Jude by Juman Peng. And it is a rat whole brain data, and it is gorgeous. Uh, 9,000 uh, proteins and about 100,000 peptides. It's in Gene Network if you want to look at it. Because uh, you, you know, our RNA seq gives you uh, proposed protein protein interactions and we we can go back and 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 test with the real stuff. Yep. So I have a question, Byron, uh, because I've always been fascinated by the uh, court intake. Did you ever try and, and look at that in terms of QTL mapping? Does it map anywhere? 
I think it does. I, I can't remember. We did we did this, and, and I think it does. And it hangs out with ethanol consumption. It hangs out with ethanol consumption, and uh, other stuff as well. And of course, the black six are real junkies. They can't get enough of this stuff. <laughs> hey, hey, Byron, I got to rib you just a little bit. And since we have we have twelve minutes, I, I'll only rib you for thirty seconds. Um, if for your contributors, hey, did you happen to use this cool website I heard about called Gene Network? I, I don't maybe you haven't heard about it. <laughs> Gee whiz. Did you? I, I couldn't tell. Some of your figures made me think maybe use Gene Network, but. And is, is the trait data in Gene Network? Yes, all the trait data there are in Gene Network. Did you find it useful as a web service? Uh, <laughs> well, marginally. <laughs> I noticed you're using the old version, Gene Network One. <laughs> I keep trying to, I keep trying to get Byron to use the new version. But, of Gene the, but the figures in Gene Network One are prettier than Gene Network Two. Uh, the maps should look the same. So let me know if they don't look the same. Okay, I think we get a, a, we get actually a, a bigger peak with uh, Gene Network Two. All right. I think of the resolution is better than the Gene Network. <laughs> Uh, a new level of p hacking you hack for, what, what algorithm gives you the best peak <laughs> <laughs> that's right okay all right well if Anybody there's no, no more questions going once twice i i actually have a question that i'm postponing to to ask Another okay Paula, this let me have it it's a, it's a big curiosity now that I have because of the three prime UTR that you mentioned of spawning. We had the same thing happening with cycling D1, which was the gene, our, uh, the gene that we found for 3NP induced toxicity. And uh, I looked in, uh, in gene network to see what is the distribution. So we, we had in that particular case, it's a small piece of the three prime UTR that it's uh, less expressed in the striatum specifically of B6 compared to D2. So I looked at different DXT strains, the information that it had, and it really clustered. I mean, whoever had the B6 allele had less expression, whoever had the D2 allele had much higher expression. Did you look at it on the spawning, the distribution between the different DXTs? Uh, we did actually, yeah. Well, uh, we, yeah, we did. And it's clustered as, as well by the, and, by the allele? And they, and they 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 separated pretty 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 cleanly. Okay, okay. So this is the thing. I mean, uh, it seems to be a big thing in, in regulation in, in the brain is the stability of the messages and translation because of the three prime HR. And, exactly. Uh, so and by the way, I did a semi quantitative RT PCR and it matches perfectly with the Affymetrix data. Well, cool. The problem, for my case, the problem is that I cannot find a mechanism, but that's another story. So, but uh, it seems to be uh, something very clear between the two strains, the D2 and the, in the, and the B6 then, more than just a few greens. So it's, it's interesting. So. Well, that's how you keep funded. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, Paula, we, we should have you come and give a talk in the GGI seminar because your story is really amazing and interesting too. That, that'd be nice. That'd be very nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we'll, see, we'll see you next week. Same time. <laughs> yeah, <week>. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Byron. And thank everyone yeah. for attending. Thank you. For uh, there will be talk. seminar next week. Okay. okay. And yeah. I wish all of you a good weekend. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Bye. Nice weekend. Bye-bye.